Hello and welcome, Recreate 7 here. And today uh, we are jumping into something new, a uh, new total conversion mod for Hearts of Iron 4. Uh, and this one is called The New Order, The Last Days of Europe, which generally goes by TNO for short. So this is a, I said a total conversion mod. Um, this puts us into the, the, not the future, but into 1960. So the future is term, as far as this game is concerned. Um, and it portrays a future where the Axis powers won the Second World War, um, but all is not rosy with the world, and they've done quite a good job of um, of world creation and kind of balance to the powers in the world. But without further ado, let's jump in and we can have a take a look at what the world is like, um, and then we talk a little bit more about the significant kind of changes in this world. Uh, so that's how we're going to talk about that. So, uh, in terms of the power blocks, there are. Uh, I suppose four, yeah, four main power blocks. You've got the the organization of free nations, which is predominantly the US, uh, with a few, I suppose, democracies that didn't fall uh, when they lost the Second World War. So things like Canada, uh, South Africa. Uh, well, actually, no, they're not formally in it yet, but you've got Canada, you've got uh, some of the Caribbeans, maybe Australia as well. We can have a look when we jump in. Then you've obviously got the Axis, uh, so that's uh, Germany and all its various puppets. Um, these guys in the middle are essentially the the warring states that now make up Russia. Uh, aren't, they are not a faction; they're all kind of independent. Uh, then you've got the, the East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, for want of a better word. They've got a proper name for this one. There's Japan and its puppets. And then finally, you've got the Triumvirate, which is the three big powers in the Mediterranean. So it's Italy, um, the Iberian Union, which is a combination of Spain and Portugal, um, and you've got Turkey as well. So, but to we. For this run anyway, are going to be playing as the Kingdom of England. We originally start off within the German sphere, uh, but we're going to be looking at um, essentially fostering the revolution and see if we can overthrow that German influence. So let's jump into map. So how does the map look? Um, pretty different. So let's have a look at... Uh, well, actually, before we look at the factions, let's have a look at the interesting geographical changes. So as I said, we are in the year 1962. The Axis have won war, a couple of things have changed. For a start, um, they have dammed the strait, uh, Gibraltar Strait. So there's now a big dam over here, and it, the plan was to turn it into uh, to generate hydroelectricity. That's not gone so well, and also if you play as the Iberian Union, one of the big kind of themes of that is actually um, getting this finished and actually becoming a, a useful endeavor. But because they dammed the Mediterranean and they lowered the sea levels, you can see some of this geography's changed. So some of these lands have blobbed out a bit. There's significantly more land um, in the where the Adriatic was. Unfortunately, this is all mainly kind of salty marsh and is generally useless. Uh, so people weren't particularly happy over the damming of the um, Blue Strait Strait there. But it has made some interesting changes. Also, Greece has blobbed out a little bit as well. The other uh, big one is down in Africa, where they built yet another dam for unknown reasons and they made an inland sea within the Congo. So again a couple of cool little uh, uh, graphical changes so uh, I have to jump in uh, as a country and then we can look at the various factions. So yeah we are going to be playing as the Kingdom of England. Let's jump into that. about it and there we go right so before we look at all the stuff shouldn't I be able to yeah there you go show you the various spheres so you've got the kind of German sphere of which we are part of um, they control the various Burgundy France Brittany has all been broken up the various Reich Commissariats in the Eastern Europe um, and then they've kind of got a chunk of Africa yeah as I said we're playing as the Kingdom of England not not Great Britain we have been, Great Britain has been chopped into pieces. Um, so ourselves and Ireland um, are on the German sphere and then Wales and Cornwall are kind of independent doing their own thing and Scotland is independent as well. One of our uh, one of our goals for this playthrough, not only to see if we can overthrow the German uh, influence and German rule, but is also see if we can reclaim the Great Britain as well. Uh, so then I said we've got yet yeah, the Triumvirate, so it's the three Mediterranean powers. I mainly so Iberia, Italy, and Turkey. Well, they're kind of puppets and, and a few other members. Um, and I don't think Turkey's got 
um, focuses and flavour yet, but Iberia and Italy do, and there's a, there's a whole set around what happens with the kind of fallout, really, of this uh, this alliance. Uh, then, as I said, you've got the US in the Organisation of Free Nations, so yeah, Canada, the Caribbean, yeah, and Australia. It's all that's starting. But I do believe South Africa can flip one with the other. And then, aside from that, you've got this mess of Russia, where it's a whole bunch of kind of small successor states. So after the kind of collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, loads of people just kind of carve out their little their little patch of land. Uh, and uh, I don't know about all of them, but certainly a vast number of these have focus trees around the reunification of of uh, Russia. Um, and then obviously you've got the German right, with Hitler still in charge. So, um, in terms of where we are and, and what England looks like at the minute, um, so in charge... We have Alec Douglas Home. So he's the leader of the King of England. Um, and but there is revolution bubbling away. But we've got uh, all sorts of people. So there's, there's kind of reformists led by Howard Millen. There's a kind of hardline fascists led by Arthur uh, Arthur Kenneth Chesterton. Um, and then there's this uh, resistance, which is trying to collaborate with all the people that want to overthrow the current rule, despite varying ideologies form under this uh, one banner of HMMLR which is Her Majesty's Most Loyal Resistance which is hopefully who we're going to end up playing as um, so you've got kind of like communists and democrats and uh, yeah left resistance and all sorts playing out so I'll not, I'll not sit and read all this you can stick a pause mood if you want but we'll get to know all these various factions as we uh, as we work through the, the focus tree there's the word I was looking for um, that's fine. One thing you do have to be aware of um, is that there is economics in this, so similar to the Fallout conversion they've put in, in money. Um, so, which actually is, is a really interesting system because uh, predominantly you spend money by using your factories. So not only obviously building lots of factories, but if you want to keep them using them, it costs you a lot of money. So we currently have a GDP of 50 billion and national debt of 39. So we'll have to keep, a, keep an eye on that to make sure we don't overspend. Uh, that's fine. I'm doing some of this, and that's just some information. All the lots and lots and lots and lots of people are working on this. It's very active. It's still going. I know they're working on a 1.2 version at the minute. Um, yeah, so plenty to to come in the future for TNO. So let's go through our various little bits and pieces. Research. So here's another thing which has massively changed in this mod. Um, and uh, yeah, just shows you the. I suppose the extent and the ambition. So they've got texts which go like all the way up to the early 90s. So most of the content they play through a minute will take you through, I think it's about 10 years worth of content, they, they reckon. Uh, so they've got tech that far surpasses this. And I know they'd like to get a game that can potentially run that long, but um, yeah, huge, huge ambition. Uh, and they've tweaked things as well. So here's maybe not too much different, you know, rifle support, equation, anti-tank, etc. A bit familiar. Supports relatively familiar. But you see down here helicopter engines, so that's something they've implemented in game. Um, armors, so obviously, we've got the more modern stuff the APC, the IFE, and the main battle tanks. Uh, artillery, uh, standard ish. Obviously, all modernized to, to fit the era we are in. Uh, doctrines, naval, so again, completely changed in terms of the types of the, the different types of ships that they've got. Uh, yep. Yeah. See, helicopters been implemented. Lots more upgrades to aircraft, so on and so forth. So you get it. Huge, huge changes. In terms of what we're going to grab first, we're probably going to start on seeing if we can't improve our industry, because that's always a generally good place to go. Um, so we can have what's this? More cap, less growth, or smaller fish to cap, more efficiency growth, and. But you get more output with this and more factories. Let's go for that one. Generally, a good place to start, but industry. Um, engineering is probably another place you want to go. 62. So let's grab the engineering, the research, the research stuff. And anything else we want to grab straight away? Probably. That's factory conversion. Maybe just make our factories more efficient. We'll have to have a look at what kind of army we're building, etc, etc, but see what it looks like. Um, 
So let's look at national folks a minute. So this is our focus tree. All right, you're probably looking at this and thinking, that's tiny. How is that going to take 10 years of content? What's going on there? Well, and this is something I think this mod does exceptionally well. And and one is something, um, I don't know if you could implement the base game, but it, it's worthwhile. Although a lot of people would get to know it eventually, but especially first time you play it, it's fantastic. So obviously you have um, this main focus tree and it's a bit of a, it'll follow a theme, so uh, which we'll look at in a moment. And then once we get to the end of it, we'll complete that. Um, and depending on which way we have gone and where we end up, we get a new focus tree. Or sometimes you'll be going through this and an event will happen and it'll open up a side focus tree over here. And so you don't see everything that's going on in one go and you kind of work through them and get new ones. Um, and it means you can kind of have branching sets of focus trees. Um, yeah, and, and I think it's done really well and stops you kind of, um, you know, being able to beeline right from the start to the end of what your country's going to get up to. So I do like that. Oh, we're going to start in one place. Tick, tock, tick, tock. The surrender of the United Kingdom at the end of the war, unfortunately, was not enough to keep dissidents quiet in England. Though many attempted conspiracies have been crushed over the years, and it looked like we might finally be past these dark times following the Third Battle of Cable Street, in recent, in recent years, a new organisation has waged war from the shadows, pretentiously titled Her Majesty's Most Loyal Resistance, they, along with the left resistance, have been a thorn in our side like none other. Assassinations, falsified anti-government propaganda, and even bombings by the HMMLR have become increasingly common. Things are starting to get out of hand. But the King is set to make a speech in the matter soon, which hopefully will help us turn public opinion to our point of view. Alright, so we'll crack on with that. Oh, just before I pause the game, so something worth pointing out. Is this uh, DEFCON in the corner? And so, depending on what happens and the kind of conflicts in the war and certain decisions various countries take, um, you can increase and decrease this DEFCON level. And it is entirely possible um, for essentially the end, the, the the game to end in uh, complete nuclear annihilation. So something to pay attention to. It's not just a not just a number that ticks up and down. It can actually have real impacts on the game. Um, I've only had. Uh, one full playthrough in a couple of the dabbles um, and I've not seen that happen yet but from what I see on the, the discords and subreddits it is, uh, it is relatively common so we'll have to see what happens in our game. Uh, so yeah, let's just slowly advance where we organise ourselves, let's throw our army together. What have we got? We've got some military police. Grab all of them. Button. All of them. There we go. We have got one artillery, yes, sir. and we have got some infantry, Ready, sir. and some trucks, well, trucks, armoured infantry, ah, inf yeah, okay, so mobile, mobile infantry, essentially. Okay, uh, in terms of our civ factories, I wish we should probably got them to start. Infrastructure is usually a good place to start, so we can increase our construction speed um, and let's do that so London's uh, well, London's already maxed out so maybe available for construction one I think we need some more civilian factories don't you and this is just going to take an absolute age to build okay interesting do that military factories how many we got 14 that's not too bad actually let's just say Yes, I would like equipment. What's going on here? An odd one. Um. For some reason I am not showing any uh, guns and tanks and planes I can build. I don't know why that is. I'll maybe let the game run for a minute or two. I definitely didn't have that problem before. Always the way though, isn't it? Uh, right, these... Lease. Where's your template? Oh. 
You are just three light infantry with support by police. Fair enough, makes sense. Please, Our infantry template is... Yeah, template and proper supporting. Okay. That's fine. We've got three dockyards. Low manpower. Oh yeah, we have no manpower. Interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, we should probably have a look at various focuses while we're, we're getting through. So we've got um, our own people's hate, so we're losing a whole bunch of political power. We've got the effect of the HMMLR, which reduces our recruitable population. Our country is lying in ruins, well, production efficiency is down, GDP growth down, can't tax, poor income, poverty, blah blah blah. Not good. Oh, yeah, just, we should talk about that before I move on. And then we've got across the channel. So we... Oh, uh... Ah, there we go. This is explains exactly what's going on there. We go. I should read this first. Uh, England is less than forty kilometers from German right, crossing this channel. And despite our best efforts, they've maintained the, con the continuing necessity of their garrison in Cornwall. Can we ha hand ever ready to strike? Treat sending any war mandates. We limit not only the size of our military, but its composition too. Restrict limited numbers of tanks and aircraft, and similarly restrict the navy and go test parody of a treaty of Versailles. Because the Germans have insisted on keeping treaties strictly enforced, it remains a possibility that if the situation in Germania or England were to change, this could be superseded. We don't get any army XP, and we have to get German permission to train stuff. Interesting. That's cool. All right, we're gonna have to see how that plays out. Um, also usual government stuff, but yeah, with uh, yeah, whole bunch of changes to to the decisions and laws. So you can see we've got stuff around political parties, religious rights, trade unions, immigration, slavery, yada yada. It's a whole bunch of stuff, which obviously all has very effects, which you can affect um either directly i can't remember if you can change this stuff directly or if it's all through decisions might be through decisions um and there's long-term stuff like here we go societal development so academia research agriculture poverty so on and so forth and this um essentially you'll implement you'll affect it to, to show the trend and over time if it goes up you'll head, head up to the next level or if it goes down you'll kind of drop down and these have quite big effects on on kind of how efficient your country is essentially that's really cool and it, it's really good it really adds a whole bunch of depth which you don't get from the from the base mod and to be fair to the uh, old world blues which playing last time they do that to a certain element um but not nowhere near as deep as we've got here Ah, here we go. Request license. Man use me fidget. Okay. All right. We'll have to just see how this goes. I'm putting the speed down. Not a whole bunch to do. Orders. Let's see. Well, let's put artillery. We've got. Oh. The copper and the rebel. Timothy of Flathy considered himself about as normal as one could be under the circumstances. He'd left school once he could read and write, followed his dad into being a bobby once he met the age requirement, got to rank of inspector, even found a nice lass to settle down with. But the rest of the world? Tim happened to think the rest of the world wasn't so normal at all. The police hadn't changed so much since the Germans invaded. Tim had never gotten the chance to, f to fight London. Er, uh, to fight. London surrenders before the Germans reached his unit's position. But he'd know more than a few good men who didn't leave to see the war's end. In his eyes, it was what had come after that had been worse. The London Uprising. I mentioned the constant terrorism. Not by Fenians, but by Englishmen against the German tyrants. And Tim had to stop them. Whatever he thought of the government, they had a point. The rebels might w well end in the Germans coming back. And for his wife and daughter's sake, he'd do anything to prevent that. So, anyone not familiar with the actual history of the UK know that during... Uh, well, probably, I don't know if it was by this period, but um, obviously post-World War right up through to, oh god, into the 80s, in fact, still bubbles a little bit away. We had a huge um, amount of issue with, with Ireland and ter terrorists incident from Ireland as, as obviously they were fighting initially for, uh, well, their freedom came much earlier than that, but generally due to the public, public religious conflict between Northern Ireland, who was uh, who had a large Protestant population and we want to stay here within the UK, um, and then the Republican uh, part of the population who were mainly Catholic and wanted to essentially Northern Ireland to reunite with Southern Ireland. So there was a lot, a lot of terrorism. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of referencing there. Not a particularly nice word and not one uh, we would tend to use. Here we go. Passing Inspector of Flattery was Griselda Robbins, a young woman 
whom the police would probably put a great amount of effort finding if they knew who she was. Griselda had grown up under the boo. She watched the Germans kill a friend in the London Uprising. I'm guessing that should say boot. And watched her brother beg on the streets because he couldn't earn a living with his leg blown off. No matter what the government promised, the Germans hadn't left. Which was why she joined HMMLR. And been easy. Griselda had followed rumours for months before they noticed her. After she passed the test of loyalty, she ended up joining the local cell. London might be the home for the traitors after all, but they were an arrogant bunch. Couldn't even notice these moving beneath it. The die is cast. Alright, so now we've got a uh, first kind of big choice in the game where you can go... Um, essentially this is kind of pro-current government. We try and suppress the rebels. Or we can go pro-rebels and try and overthrow, which is... Her Majesty's most loyal resistance, a catch-all term for a problem that has eluded solutions for nigh on 20 years. The current organisation is probably better described as a combination of three. David Sterling and his commandos are the largest rogue military unit in England which didn't surrender following the war, and the only one still active in England proper. Bill Alexander and the left resistance are an amalgamation of a sort of leftist partisans and labour supporters, though they might not be as influential as the CPGB that perished at 3rd Cable Street. Don't know who that is, but fair enough. In Furin, however, the original HMMLR leader is unknown. Some spy master in the shadows, no doubt if he even still lives, but he somehow managed to get almost every major partisan organisation in England to answer him. Despite ideological differences, this organisation is a thorn in our side. We must exercise it. So this will enable gameplay from their perspective and to sabotage their speech. Yeah, uh, okay, we've got no events. So you'll, 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 we will find that um, the focuses will generally uh, then lead to other events and decisions which you need to take. But we will get to that, right? I do need a drink after all that reading. Oh, right. Man. Here, let's throw all our all our uh, blah, 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 soldiers in one, and let's let's line up against Wales. Look, devious. That'll do. Now let's see if we've got any Get commanders. Up. Well, I'm sure it'll all change when the rebel breaks out. Yeah, we've got some pretty high level generals. Running speed. It may doesn't really matter. It'll all change. But sure, Evelyn, there you go. You can be our general here. We've we got in terms of field commanders. Oh, Monty. There you go, Monty. And sure, I'm like, oh, right. I never looked at a fleet either. Oh, not yet. We've got a couple of convoys. How many convoys have we got? Am I being blind? I cannot see. I don't know. Right, let's focus on this first. Griselda was part of one of the only HMMLR cells inside the city of London proper, probably the only one which wasn't outright underground. First she'd just been a regular member. With those above her being continually killed or driven out by the collabs, she soon found herself the leader of the cell. Most of her days consisted of working as a barmaid in a pub sympathetic to the cause, listening in on conversations and keeping an eye out for new recruits. Every now and then though, her cell would get some real work. Smuggling out firearms, explosives, or even important people to sales in other parts of the country. Of course, sometimes the higher-ups wanted her to do something. As far as Griselda knew, she answered to whomever coordinated London proper, but she never saw them and only got marching orders through a dead drop or a coded letter. If she were to be honest with herself, Griselda wasn't that fussed on the return of the Queen or whatever the official line was. Griselda wanted revenge against those who'd betrayed England. If HMMLR were one's offering, who was she to turn them down? She was part of the fight for freedom. She would die for it if need be. Motivations of a person can be as simple as a knife or as complex as a maze. Cool. Next up, gears move. Funny thing about any moving machine is that it keeps moving, even when the operator is no longer there to guide it. Everyone can agree that the statement applied to HMMLR, but with different definitions. 
collaborationist government thinks of the organisation is like a speeding car with no driver, going aimlessly till it runs out of fuel or veers off the road and comes to a halt. They see rebellion as a shadow of its former self, huddled in the hills or cowering in the sewers, and a victory for law and order against the forces of anarchy is a matter of when instead of if. The men and women of HMMLR, however, prefer a different analogy. They see themselves as a different machine, one does not need an operator once activated, one that can safely be left alone until the moment fulfill its duty is at hand. They are a ticking time bomb, and they are counting down to the beginning of His Majesty's speech. And more weapons for them for, for our rebels, more power, and a new event. Cool. So here we go. Big uh, big new thing in the event system. Uh, so we have the state of a nation. So government control, HMLR control disputed. That's cool. So it shows our support in obvious places. Ah, nice. So I'll start off 50-50. Stable the state is. I like it. Um, so our relations with OFN. So naturally, to conduct any serious operation requires weapons, rifles, gates, and etc. We need to prepare ourselves for general uprising as well, which will require arming even more people than we do now. We need to get this is through legally questionable means, namely the gun trade. So we can get guns from OFN using contacts friendly to us. However, the actual number of our guns that get through is dependent on how stable Northern England is. Once we openly confront the government, these guns will be issued as infantry equipment to our troops. The higher the state stability in Newcastle, Lancashire, New Yorkshire, the higher the chance of our guns getting through, and the less we lost to the government. Each month, relations will partly degrade by a small month. All right. So we spend our political power. So we can do a small gun, small gun shipment. We can do. Requires a minimum level of excellent relations. Okay, we can't do that end. So these are big ones essentially if we get there. Okay, we can get a large boost, small boost, multiple moderate over time, multiple small boosts over time. So 140. Why don't we say these guys go on tour and we'll run medium gun shipment that sounds good oh I'm as bits down here the King's speech the collaboration government is like a sieve nothing stays secret for long and anything can be bought for price in this case the boss has received information that the traitor King Edward is going to make a speech to calm the nation in this time of uncertainty how quaint well it just won't do to have our organization be organization be unrepresented at this moment's occasion indeed we ought to send representatives of our own to proceedings Heavily armed representatives. Of course, this isn't the kind of action that can take place with extensive planning. The HMMLR needs to prepare our response to the collaborationist attempts to hide the truth of how they have failed England and its people. With some luck, our message will ring out forever. We can send him an agent. Act for today's periodic change of safety will degrade. All right, infiltrate the palace. Both periodic change of the safety of the future speech and the safety of the speech itself. Hang on. Both the periodic change, fine. Oh, okay. This is going to happen. So we can push this down towards minus 10. And... The actual speech will be affected by this as well. Okay, let's let's try that. Cool, interesting. Let's see what happens when these things finish. We'll go up. We want you to go down. The. Uh, Northern Rebellion at stage. Ah, there we go. That's good. Uh, and this will make that go down to minus 10, hopefully. Hitler names Bormann his successor. 
Uh, following a recent attempt on the German Führer's Reich, ooh, by sector Kente, Kempe Tai agent, the pressure upon the Führer team official successor and the Reichstag to formally recognize the choice has been steadily building. For almost a week of debate and speculation, Adolf Hitler today appeared on live television from the Reichstag and announced to the Reich that his survivor would be Martin Bormann. Considered the most likely choice, the decision has been welcomed by moderate and conservative elements of Germany. All the liberals and some element of the military have expressed concern, with Bormann's commitment to staying the course of Nazism with only minor reform. Albert Speer, Hermann Göring and Reinhard Heydrich have criticised the choice as being certain to drive the Reich into an early grave. Hmm. Obviously... Well, we'll see. We'll see. I'll not spoil it. No spoilers. Uh, so uh, these looks pretty stable. Uh, so really we want to try and push... Flip some of these places, don't we? Don't know how to do that yet. I expect it's going to be a balancing of our political points for state of the nation versus getting more guns um, versus spending the guns on making sure this is as terrible as, pop as possible. We've got a fair few. Oh, we're paused. We've got a fair few. Um, uh, for, what are these called? Focuses. Words. Thank you. To work through before we get to the actual speech itself. It's cool, it's just this whole thing has just a completely uh, different element of gameplay. Um, you know, and, and and it does make, they have made a very live feeling world. Not just simply, here's a couple of folks who go to war and, you know, take over everyone. I will say there are a few issues with the, with the mod and some of the content of the mod. Um, just namely, they've been, they've created a fairly realistic world. Um, but that does mean there's certain elements in here are heavily kind of pro-Nazism um, and uh, yeah, you never want to really create that kind of sandbox where the kind of Nazi fanboys get to live out their, their dreams. Uh, you don't want to support that. So there's a few things I think that they can do with tweaking, but I think in the vast majority, I think they do it very well, uh, a very good job of kind of representing it in a realistic and believable way without uh, like bringing focus to nor glossing over the kind of velocity side of things. That's always difficult when you're dealing with uh, games around not only the Second World War but also around kind of different scenarios where especially where the Nazis were successful. Okay, strings of a plan. No one quite knew who the boss actually was. Ah, to be sure, everyone knew of Mad David Sterling and the Red General Alexander. One had refused to surrender with the rest of the army, had fought on since the end of the war, and the other was the most notorious communist of escaped Cable Street. Some thought those two were the leaders of HMMLR, and the boss was a smokescreen, a fiction to keep the traitor's attention elsewhere. Griselda personally thought that unlikely as she looked at the two. Griselda personally thought that unlikely as she looked at the two. In spite of their congeniality and pointing out key locations on the map of London, uh, all she could think about was that they obviously didn't like each other very much. It was the small things, the way Sterling grimaced when Alexander rebuked his, rebuked his idea of placing dynamite on the bridge on account of the casualties, or how Alexander frowned when Sterling suggested his men would be better suited to an open attempt on the king. Griselda was at the meeting because she was the highest ranking cell leader in London, not forced underground sobering thought considering that she wasn't even in her 30s. There had been plenty who came before her and plenty who'd come after her, it seemed. And that was when the idea formed in her mind. What if I do it? She interrupted in a small voice. The two HMMLR leaders looked up at her in surprise. Bill Alexander gestured for her to continue whilst Sterling looked over her with a fresh eye as if searching for something he'd missed before. I mean, I walk through that square each day for work. Bobbies know me well enough they don't think twice about why I'm going so close to the cordon. Griselda stopped and waited for two's response. In the end, it was Sterling who answered, How familiar are you with grenade throwing? HMMLR has all sorts, including the brave ones. This doesn't seem like a a greatly thought through um, plan. Just get a little bit close and lob a grenade at the dude, but hey. Who am I to judge? Big, big love. Most of HMML are moderates by any sense of the word. Men and women who want fr Ah, pause. Right, we'll do that in a minute. Most of HMML are moderates by any sense of the word. Men and women who want freedom more than anything specific. But David Sterling and Bill Alexander have other goals. Sterling wants revenge. 
He's about the only surviving man still in the country who never surrendered, and he's lost a lot of friends for that. Bill Alexander wants his revolution, though he's willing to forgo that to get the Germans out of Britain for good. He lost a lot of friends on 3rd Cable Street during the first uprising, but he survived, and he'll have his turn to do the killing. So, I'm guessing that was uh, a communist uprising which failed then, that 3rd Cable Street disaster. Auchinleck, meanwhile, he wants the Traitor King's speech to be a proper show, complete with HMML art of the entertainment. Sterling Alexander might hate the other's guts, but they're more experienced in guerrilla warfare than the rest of HMML art combined. Time for them to use it. We've got... I think, uh, if I'm right, Auchinleck just seems to be the kind of... Um, I suppose he's the, the moderate rebel, if there's such a thing. You know, return to uh, well, okay, Queen as head of state and uh, Germans out and ruling England for the English, but in a kind of uh, constitutional monarchy type design, as was before. And then we've got just the dude who wants to fight because he's a soldier, and then the communist. See if this feature sheet drops. Periodic space feature also drops. We get a plan in motion. This seems to be going pretty smooth sailing. Gunship and mostly successful. Okay. How, how successful is mostly successful? Did I not? I didn't click start. Um. Oh yeah, we've got like 400 guns there. We're still at moderate relations. What do we need for this? High and excellent. So we'll need to boost those at some point. Meanwhile, this is tanking. So I'm all for that. Don't need to do anything just yet. Uh, more guns? Not only more guns will give us more relations as well. And let's do a small boost. Let's get some more guns. Let's just say we've got over a thousand and then we'll see if we can focus on relations to get a large one. I'm interested to see what this is. Special project shipments. Hmm. Armored units. That would be cool. Three ships we can make, and we cannot retry a failed one. To so make sure our stability is high, our relations are high. We can do that. What decisions are available? Oh, yeah, that's okay. I don't think we need to do this because this just affects the, affects the periodic change and we cannot get lower than minus 10s. But the safety of the speech is, <laughs> is about to be zero. But I'm assuming that will change in the future. Otherwise we have far more weapons than we need. He had no doubt that right as he was standing over the map of London, the reactionaries would be sending a dozen raids after him in England's north. Such a shame they didn't realise that he was in a basement not a kilometre away from Buckingham Palace itself. Bill Alexander chuckled at the thought, gaining the attention of the man next to him. Sometimes Bill regretted signing the left resistance up with HMMLR, and any time he had to work personally with David Sterling only made, him, only made the feeling resurface. The man was effective, to be sure. Sterling had kept his commandos alive by sheer unrelenting determination for nearly 20 years. But he was also ruthless and unconcerned with civilian casualties. It made Bill think he was quite possibly mad. Bill had his men smuggling the grenades in the days before his arrival and Philby had sent word that the reactionaries still thought Bill was in Manchester. Sterling, in turn, had escorted Bill down to the Traitor Central, as the ex-SES referred to London. King wouldn't like the welcome they'd prepared for him. Sterling was glancing at him to see if the chuckle had meant anything, but Bill just waved him off. The evacuation point is a boat in the Thames, which will take you north, you understand? Finish any unfinished business you have here, because you won't be coming back any time soon. To her credit, Griselda, the local HMMLR cell leader, just nodded, committing the plan to memory. Against his expectations, Bill was starting to have a good feeling about the whole exercise, he only hoped Claude was handling things in his absence. Let's get the party started. Ha. The King's speech is shaping up to be quite the event. Some might want to break out the champagne and call it a day, but London is practically being isolated in preparation for it. 
The question on everyone's lips though is, why? Third Cable Street was years ago and there hasn't been any real violence in London since. Almost like the government is worried about something. The press for their part are busy speculating and issuing declarations of solidarity. Some speculate as to whether it's necessary to block off all of London and to put in the curfews for what is, at best, a theoretical tr threat. The government, for its part, said that they will go ahead with these measures anyway. Little do we know. Oh, we're up to high relations, that's good. We could go for a large one if we get, if we had the PP. Gone up by three fifty, maybe. A war? Oh no, it's an end of the war. Feelings people front have been successful. Okay. Ah, shucks, we're actually losing power. Okay. Well, I guess we're not doing any more of these then. It's annoying because our relations are going to degrade. Womp womp. I wonder if this is going to be an ongoing uh, way to get our equipment once the war starts. I don't know how quickly it'll break out. Can't remember uh, how long it took in my previous play. I wasn't even paying attention to be honest. I was I was focused on Liberia and dealing with the dam, the dam, dam.